The crew of a passenger jet search in vain for their airport. Go carefully. Rain is making it impossible to see. Inside mist approach. Go around. More than 200 passengers are on board. As I turned around, a huge fireball came out. Investigators search for clues. Could a vital missing piece of equipment be responsible for the crash? I think the best way to describe that would have been irresponsible. I know a lot of people could have walked off that plane that night. Nothing will change my views on that. Nimitz Hill, Guam. Once the site of fierce American offensives during World War II, for over 50 years, there's been peace here. Now the hill is peaceful, invaded by hunters, and the normal quiet is broken by the roar of jumbo jets as they fly overhead. Every night, commercial pilots must fly over this tall, rocky outcrop and land at Guam's Aganya International Airport. Flights come from airports all across Asia. Just past midnight on August the 6th, 1997, Korean Airlines Flight 801 is on its way to Guam from Seoul, South Korea. 42-year-old captain Park Young Chol is at the controls. A former Korean Air Force pilot, Park has been flying 747s for more than six years. Just a few months ago, he received a flight safety award from the president of Korean Air for successfully handling a 747 engine failure at low altitude. Park is supposed to be flying to the United Arab Emirates tonight, but a scheduling change has put him in command of this shorter flight to Guam. In the cabin, Korean, Japanese and Western tourists are heading for Guam's pristine beaches. Guam is a US territory run under US law. The island is tiny, fewer than 600 square kilometers, but there's enough sand to keep people coming. Twenty-four-year-old Sean Burke and his girlfriend, Wendy Bunton, are planning to make the most of Guam's beaches. They're flying in from San Diego for a vacation. Sean and Wendy were uh, going to Guam to do some scuba diving, reef diving, and um... And at the same time, they were going to visit her brother, who was in the Navy over there. He was a Navy doctor. Flight 801 is taking Barry Small back to work. He's returning to Guam from New Zealand for another six-month contract as a helicopter pilot. But he does it with a heavy heart. The night before I left, uh, my father had a heart attack. And I had to CPR him until the ambulance arrived and decided to cancel the contract so I could uh, help him. But he was insistent that you must carry on with your job. The flight is still a couple of hours from Guam when the calm evening is brutally interrupted. Watch the speed, it could be severe turbulence. Make an announcement to have everyone in their seats with seatbelts on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first officer speaking. Even an experienced flyer like Barry Small is surprised. There was no lead up to this turbulence at all. 
anybody that wasn't strapped down was going to be heavy on this for sure. The lockers were rattling and uh, anything uh, in those lockers was, was bound to break. It was uh, a horrendous shudder. It's heavy turbulence. But the crew ride it out. Eventually, the flight returns to normal. We're through it. Let the passengers know. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first officer speaking. We have cleared the turbulent area. But it's left some of the passengers shaken. It's okay, Rika. We'll be there soon. Ma'am, if you don't mind, I'm going to move this duty-free up here for you. The cabin crew cleans up. And the passengers settle in for the rest of the trip. Because of the 12-hour stopover in, in Seoul and no change of clothes, um, it was getting rather uncomfortable in a tropical environment. And I took my shoes off just to, to relax a little bit and feel more comfortable. Captain Park and his crew begin looking ahead. They know there's more unsettled weather coming. Rain has been hitting Guam on and off all day. In fact, August is the heart of the island's rainy season. Small showers can pop up, making visibility unpredictable. In that particular part of the world, they have what's called a top hat thunderstorm. That is a very small thunderstorm that builds up all times of the day, and it's very short life. So it wouldn't hamper the pilot's ability to actually conduct the approach. It's going to just obscure his view for some period of time while they're transiting through it. Just past one in the morning, Korean Air Flight 801 makes initial radio contact with Kurt Mayo, the radar controller at Guam's airport. Guam Center, Korea 801, leaving level 410 for 2600. Korean Air 801, roger. The crew aren't the only ones preparing to land. After more than three hours of flying through the night, the passengers get ready for the airport. I saw the, the lights of Guam and I knew exactly where the aircraft was because I've been there many times before. Captain Park has navigated Nimitz Hill nine times before, but this time there's a major difference. At airports around the world, pilots land with the help of a glide slope, an electronic system that helps planes safely touch down. If pilots follow the directions given by the glide slope, it guides them to the foot of the runway. The glide slope beacon at Guam Airport has been removed for extensive maintenance. Without the airport transmitter, Park's glide slope indicator in the cockpit is useless. Landing without a glide slope is rare, but it does happen. In Guam, the transmitter is scheduled to be out of service for more than two months. But impaired navigation is only part of the problem. Captain Park is fighting exhaustion. They make us classic guys work to the maximum. Probably this way, hotel expenses are saved on cabin crews and they maximize flight hours. Really sleepy. Now, as the plane approaches Guam, clouds and rain block their way. Captain, Guam condition is no good. It's raining a lot. It's been several hours since Captain Park and his crew left Seoul. Now the rain is making the late flight more difficult. Tired and fighting the weather, the captain begins the final approach to the airport. August the 6th, 1997. It's close to 1.30 in the morning. On Korean Airlines Flight 801, a tired captain is preparing to land at Aganya Airport on the island of Guam. In the cabin, 237 passengers are getting ready to begin their holidays or get back to work. 
The flight, other than the turbulence, was um, totally normal. We had our meals and it was just a totally normal flight in every way. As the jet approaches Guam, an erratic storm pushes rain and clouds between the plane and the airport. It's hard to see. The captain wants to make a small change in course to avoid the worst of the weather. Request 20 mile deviation to the left as we are descending. Guam Center, Kuya 801, request deviation 10 miles left of track. Queen Air 801, roger. Veering around cloud cover, Captain Park Yung Chol struggles to get a clear view of his approach. And finally, he sees what he's been looking for. It's Guam. Guam. Good. Today, the weather radar helps us a lot. Korean Air 801 cleared for ILS, runway 6, left approach. Glide slope unusable. Air traffic controller Kurt Mayo reminds the crew that the airport's glide slope equipment is out of service. It would normally help them find the runway, but since it's under repair, it isn't sending out any signals. Then, with the crew in the middle of their landing sequence, something unexpected happens. The glide slope appears to come to life. Is the glide slope working? The glide slope, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's working. Why is it working? It's a confusing moment. Unsure what's happening, the crew continue to prepare for their landing. 60 check. Gear down. Check. Approaching 1,400. Since today's glide slope condition is not good, we need to maintain 1,440. Please set it. Set. At 40 minutes after one in the morning, Guam controller Kurt Mayo once again makes contact with the crew. Korean Air 801 contacting Ganya Tower 118.1. He passes the plane on to the airport tower and says goodbye in Korean. Ganya Ikaseo. It's the last time he'll ever talk to the crew of the jetliner. The guy working here probably was a GI in Korea before. Aganya Tower, Korean Air 801 to intercept the localizer, six left. Korean Air 801 Heavy, Aganya Tower, runway six, clear to land. Korean 801 Roger, clear to land, six left. Slap 30. Flaps 30. As the plane descends, clouds and rain close in again. They've lost sight of the airport. Look carefully. Ladies and gentlemen, we're preparing for landing at Aganya International Airport in Guam. Please return your seats to the upright position, fasten your seatbelt, and prepare for landing. Set 560 feet. As the plane flies closer to the ground, the crew expects they'll see the airport any second, but the rain makes it hard to see anything. Isn't the glide slope working? Wiper on. Then a computerized voice fills the cockpit. It's the ground proximity warning system, which tells the crew they're just 500 feet in the air. But they still can't see the runway. I've done this flight many, many times before. And when I estimated we're about 30 seconds from landing, I bent down to put my shoes on. The plane is now just 200 feet above the ground, but still the crew can't see the runway. They're quickly running out of time. Let's make a missed approach. Not inside. Not inside, missed approach. Go around. Go around. Perhaps.
I had no doubts this was still just a normal landing and the aircraft went on and, and was decelerating quicker than normal, but, but nothing to really alarm me. Things were getting pretty serious then. The aircraft was starting to break apart. So I forced myself up to look, and there was just bottles, bags, everything you can imagine was coming out. The only way I can really describe it is like about a, a thousand 737s landing all at once. On a wooded hillside in Guam, the shattered plane finally grinds to a halt. I was too scared to undo my seatbelt at that stage because I was waiting for the next bounce to go over an extra, another ravine or whatever was going to happen next. Miraculously, 11-year-old Rika Matsuda has survived and is virtually unhurt. But her mother is trapped and injured. Barry Small is also injured and terrified that fire is sweeping through the plane. The fire started in the front and proceeded to, from the front to the back towards me. There was no floor lighting or anything like that, but the fire was so intense there was no problems to see where I was going. <laughs> If help doesn't arrive soon, those who survived the initial crash may be trapped inside the cabin. Korean Air 801 Heavy Tower, how do you hear? Everyone in the cockpit has been killed. But airport authorities still have no idea what's happened aboard Flight 801. Hurt by the crash and desperate to escape the ruined plane, Barry Small stumbles towards an opening in the cabin. I got back these, these six, six seats and then there was about a six foot drop down to the ground. The undercarriage had gone completely. I came across an obstacle that I had to, to cross because it was the only part that wasn't burning. Here, go! Rika's mother tells her daughter to get out of the burning plane. Go. Go. Go, go now, get out of here. Go. Now go, go. You must go. Go. You must go, go now. Go. The fire is spreading quickly. As passengers struggle to deal with a disaster, rescue workers don't even know the plane's gone down. The fire engulfed both the Asian gentleman and myself to the extent that it burnt my arms and my watch got that hot, it was melting into my, into my flesh. 
and I had to flick it off. Minutes earlier, Kurt Mayo had passed the passenger jet onto the local tower controllers. Now he learns it hasn't landed yet. Approach Agania. Did Korean Air come back to you? No. I cleared him to land, and I don't know where he's at. He didn't land? Negative. Oh my god. Within minutes, Guam Fire Chief Chuck Sanchez is en route. I was thinking, my God, 747, where is it at? Is it on island? Is it on sea? Uh, what is the plan here? Both fell off the side of the container and the Asian gentleman disappeared into the jungle. So I rolled over onto my back and I managed to crawl with my elbows. There was still a bit of skin on my elbows left. Small has a badly broken right leg. He crawls away from the wreckage. Many more people remain trapped inside. Lying there, it just sounded like a battlefield. It was just like a movie. Things were exploding short of me, going over the top of me. Things were landing beside us on fire. It's just indescribable. There's only one way for emergency crews to get down to the wreck site along a single access road that runs beside Nimitz Hill. As they race to the accident scene, rescue workers discover a major obstacle. A pipeline has been ripped out of the ground by the crash and thrown across the road. There's no way around it. Having heard about the crash, the island's governor, Carl Guterres, has joined the rescue team. Engine Company 7, get this thing out of the way. You guys, get the medic kits and come with me. We reached the closest point of approach to the crash site, which was up the hill, and probably about another 150 yards downhill. I go, gentlemen, uh, turn on whatever lights you got to uh, guide us down this path, and uh, let's, let's do it. We started running and just listening to the screams so we can guide ourselves uh, because there was just nothing but overgrowth on the side of the road. Uh, at one point, I stopped him. I go, Governor, um, sir, I need you to make some serious decision in this operation, and I don't think I want you to move further. Uh, I'd like for you to stay on this side, and uh, you know, I don't want you to get hurt. You know, let us do this job. And he goes, no, I want to help you guys. At the sight of the crash, flames are devouring the wreckage. <laughs> Hampered by his broken leg, Small can only look on as people cry out for help. I lay at that bank for the whole night during that time, hearing people call out in a foreign language, which initially sounded like good, healthy calls for help, then turn into screams as the fire got more intense. And after a period of time, the fire even grew worse and the screams faded away. Finally, almost an hour after the accident, Sanchez's crew reaches the site. I split them up into two rescue and search units. I need half of you guys to start from the tail end, and I need the other half to start from the front end of this plane. And let's meet in the middle, and uh, you know, let's do what we can to help the survivors here. Guam's governor, Carl Guterres, sees Rika Matsuda all alone and crying out for her mother. Okay. 
I did not dare let her go. It's something that I almost like there was a bond between me and that young that little girl. And I found out later she was 11, but she looked really smaller than 11 years old. Fire Chief Chuck Sanchez finds Barry Small in the sword grass. He gave me his fire jacket and put it under my head to comfort me. Here, go. I'm all right, let's go. Later on, he was very distressed that he had to come back and get it back because he was getting burnt, dragging people and bodies out of the aircraft. We were cutting trees to use for splint. Uh, we were taking off our uh, protective gears to uh, cover the survivors. It's clear to rescue personnel that for many, they've arrived too late. But Sanchez isn't giving up. He sends a team to search further into the wreckage. Group two, start at the tail and work forward. Go. What I heard was this large explosion, man, right where they were at. Benigo, did we lose our people? A Boeing 747 has crashed on a rugged hillside in Guam, just a few miles short of the airport. There were 254 people on board. Rescue workers comb through the wreckage when an explosion rips through the remains of the plane. No radio transmission at all. We lost all transmission. And uh, then finally, somebody came out. Um, Sir, we're OK. Uh, we survived the explosion, uh, everybody's accounted for. It's not until the dawn finally comes that rescue workers can see the extent of the damage. The plane has spilled down the mountain and broken into several large pieces. Only 26 people survived the disaster. Friends and family are desperate for any news. Many bodies are badly burned. Although most of the passengers are Korean, Sean Burke and his girlfriend Wendy Bunton are among a few Americans on the flight. Thousands of kilometers away, news of the crash reaches Sean's parents. When she hears about the crash, Sean Burke's stepmother doesn't know if Sean is alive or dead. He could have been uh, burned in the crash. He could be unconscious in a local hospital there. And we just wanted to go over and bring him back. So, I mean, because that kept going through our minds that He possibly could be laying on the hillside. Since Guam is an American territory, the responsibility for investigating the crash falls to the National Transportation Safety Board. Greg Fife is the lead investigator. When he arrives on the site, he has to contend with more than just the carnage of the plane crash. Grieving family members surround the scene, making it especially difficult for investigators to work. As an accident investigator, you have to keep your emotions in check. It's like being a doctor in an ER room. You, have, you, you see this devastation, you see this tragedy unfolding in front of you. 
you hear about all of the, the sad stories, especially when there are kids and, and innocent people involved. And as an accident investigator, you have to keep those emotions in check because you have to remain objective. You have to remain emotionless to be able to do your job effectively. And we had a whole building full of people just like us. They were all grieving and crying out. It was just horrible. One of the first things we did was we went out on site and we did a, what we call a site survey. We had to really get an understanding of what we were dealing with as far as the wreckage and how we were gonna conduct the on-scene investigation. During the preliminary investigation, Fife finds that large sections of the plane are almost completely intact. The airplane landed relatively under control. That is that the pilot basically landed the airplane into the trees and into that terrain. Unfortunately, it was three miles from the airport. Investigators find a number of items that survived the crash and the fire that followed, including the landing chart the crew was using as it approached Guam Airport. Investigators also find Captain Park's travel bag, and in it discover a small plastic pill container. Captain Park had been prescribed a variety of drugs, including pills containing benzodiazepine, a class of drugs often used as a sedative. The pills and tissue samples from Captain Park's remains are sent for analysis. The landing chart becomes part of a growing pile of evidence. Using information from the jet's flight data recorder, investigators recreate the plane's flight path. The relatively gentle slope of its descent supports Fyth's belief that the jet all but landed on the hillside. But the flight path shouldn't look like this. Korean Air 801 cleared for ILS, runway 6, left approach. Glide slope unusable. Korean 801, roger, clear for ILS, runway 6, left. The crew had been told that the glide slope at the airport wasn't working. It meant that the captain had to take more manual control of his plane. It is now up to the pilot to fly an established procedure called a step down, where he starts at an altitude of, say, 2,000 feet. He, when, when he gets to a particular point located by what they call DME, or distance measuring equipment, he then starts a descent to another prescribed altitude. If the crew was following the step down procedure, its flight path would resemble a set of stairs. But after the first step, the plane enters a long, slow descent. If you don't hit those step downs, and those altitudes are prescribed to give you terrain clearance, if you don't fly that, as depicted on the approach chart, you run the risk of flying into an obstruction or high terrain. The plane's cockpit voice recorder has also been recovered from the debris. Fife and his team begin to analyze it hoping to better understand what happened in the cockpit. Set 563. On two separate occasions, Captain Park gave orders to descend long before he was supposed to. But there are other clues on the tape as well. The cockpit voice recorder provided us, the investigators, quite a bit of information. But one of the key elements that we found was that the flight crew appeared to be tired. Really sleepy. And this was a chartered flight, so it would have put them on what we call backside of the clock flying. That is, they wouldn't be normally flying during the day, they are now flying at night. And typically your body says you should be asleep when it's dark outside. The sedatives could have made a difficult situation even worse. But when the lab results come back, they're conclusive. While he had the pills with him, there are no traces of them in Captain Park's system. When lead investigator Greg Fyth returns to the cockpit voice recorder, he focuses on the captain's discussion of the glide slope. Is the glide slope working? The glide slope, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's working. Why is it working? Uh, 
he started to see the glide slope needle move a little bit and started to question the other crew members as to whether or not the glide slope was actually working or not. It's early in the morning. After a long flight, Captain Park is tired, perhaps confused and distracted by the unexpected readings on his glide slope. It became very apparent listening to the cockpit voice recorder that in fact he got fixated. But Fife still doesn't understand why Park's glide slope appeared to be working. Was there a problem on this plane? Or is the equipment susceptible to problems that could affect other jets as well? To find out, he brings in navigation expert Nelson Spornheimer. I spent some time looking at the transcript, uh, trying to determine what the navigation issues were, why the, a good airplane was in the wrong place, and to investigate the apparent confusion on the part of the crew who thought that the glide slope was working at least part of the time. Spornheimer sends a team of investigators to Guam. They fly over the island, trying to determine whether radio signals from a nearby military base could have acted on the plane, making it seem like the glide slope was working. Glide slope receivers can respond to non-glide slope signals, particularly when the intended glide slope signal is absent. If, if there are spurious signals on the channel and they contain the right information, they can cause intermittent movements of the glide slope needle. Set 560 feet. But the signals wouldn't be sustained. Like a light switch turning quickly on and off, the glide slope indicator would give periodic indications that it was working, but not for long. My conclusion was that spurious signals, whether they be from other transmitters or failed ground equipment, such as personal walkie-talkies, could not cause a sustained warning flag movement. If the glide slope wasn't fully operating, why did Park believe it was? And even if he did believe it was working, why did he crash into Nimitz Hill? Isn't the glide slope working? Wiper on. As investigators continue to try to piece together the causes of the crash, Barry Small is trying to understand why he and 25 others survived. I went to touch my shoes, we hit the ground and I was accidentally in the perfect crash position by some, some sort of miracle. An airline engineering apprentice and helicopter pilot, Small understands airplanes. I do firmly believe there are some changes that could be made to aircraft. Small believes that the way crossbars are built into aircraft seats caused one of his legs to break, but luck saved his other leg. My right leg went forward and crashed into the bar in front of the seat and broke. And my left leg was saved by my carry bag, stopping my leg going forward and hit that bar. Still able to walk on his one good leg, Small escapes while others remain trapped inside. Since she's young, Rika Matsuda's legs are shorter than a normal adult. Sitting normally, her legs wouldn't have been pressed against the crossbar on impact, so she was able to escape the plane. No, go now, get out of here. While her mother died. Small is also convinced that the flames that first spread through the cabin of Korean Air Flight 801 were preventable. They estimate that those top lockers had over 462 litres of burnable alcohol on board. Had the plane been full, there could be at least twice that amount. During the crash, Small believes that the duty-free alcohol mixed with oxygen in the plane's ceiling. The combination ignited with deadly results. It's a fire he thinks could have been prevented. Why have this risk, alcohol and oxygen? I thought, you know, if we're Aircraft's about safety, and this is a, just a blatant breaking of the rules of safety as far as I'm concerned. As he continues to recover from the accident, Small is determined to prevent what had happened to him from happening to others. He decides to push for changes on how seats are made and how duty-free alcohol is stored. 
For NTSB investigator Greg Fyth, the biggest question still remains. How did an experienced pilot, one recently honored by his company for his safety record, crash his plane five kilometers short of the airport? As the investigation continues, he discovers that the landing chart the crew was using was more than six months old and out of date. It's an indication that the crew could have been better prepared for the landing. When he reviews the training practices for Korean Airlines, Fife uncovers more gaps in the information that the crew received. We found that the Korean Airlines flight crew had all of their training based on airports with approaches where the DME was always co-located at the airport. DME is distance measuring equipment, electronic beacons that tell pilots where they are in relation to the airport. Often the final beacon is found at the foot of the runway. That was not the case in Guam. The airport was in fact five kilometers further on. Struggling to see through the rain, Park was unable to find the airport. Distracted by the unexpected glide slope readings, Park used the final beacon as a guide, expecting it to take him right to the runway. Let's make a missed approach. Not inside. Not inside. Missed approach. Go around. Go around. Perhaps. It's clear that Flight A01 flew an approach about three miles premature. In other words, the descent was about three miles early. It was a nominal approach otherwise, just to the wrong location. We think that based on fatigue and um, some of their training, that in fact, when the flight crew crashed the airplane, when the counter got to zero, they thought the airport should be there. A fully loaded 747 weighs more than 200,000 kilograms. Like an enormous ocean liner, it can't change course quickly. Blinded by rain and relying on their equipment, the crew of Korean Air Flight 801 thought they were heading straight at the runway. When they realized something was wrong, it was too late. As the investigation continues, Fife and his team make a startling discovery. Equipment that would have given the crew more time to react had been disabled on purpose. In August of 1997, the crash of Korean Air Flight 801 took the lives of more than 200 people. The final accident investigation report is published more than two years after the crash. It lays blame on the Korean Airlines training methods and the crew's over-reliance on the jet's automation. But it also has sharp words reserved for the FAA, the body that regulates air travel in the United States. Because of an FAA decision, a critical piece of technology that could have saved Flight 801 was intentionally disabled. The Minimum Safe Altitude Warning System, or MSOAR, is a standard piece of equipment at major American airports. But in Guam, the FAA had made a critical alteration to the way it was used. MSOR uses radar to watch the planes as they come into the airport. If they're too low, a warning is given to air traffic controllers, who can then relay it to the crew. But in Guam, the system kept giving nuisance readings to controllers. The controllers kept getting these nuisance warnings. They redesigned the software and moved the limitations of the MSAW further away from the airport where it afforded no one a level of protection. Instead of watching the planes as they neared the airport, the system in Guam now tracked them when they were more than 80 kilometers away over the ocean. 
I think the best way to describe that would have been and should be irresponsible because you've taken this system that was designed as a level of protection, not only for the controller, but you've taken the protection away from the flying public. For the passengers and crew of Flight 801, the lack of the MSOR system sealed their fate. If the system had been working, the crash could have been avoided. Without it, the crew had no warning at all. The two pilots didn't want to die. They had families. No one wanted to die. Um, we still do not blame them. Is The bottom line is nobody wanted to be in that situation. It was just something that happened. For Barry Small, the years since the crash of Flight 801 have been emotional and frustrating. The Civil Aviation Authority in his homeland of New Zealand has acknowledged the potential danger posed by duty-free liquor on board, but so far no policies have been changed. His desire to modify airplane seat design has also been ignored. I have taken several steps to um, put this idea forward, and in a lot of cases it's initially met, it, met with enthusiasm but it eventually ends up in the too hard basket. And when I try to approach seat design people, there's no one wants to hear about it. Sean Burke was never officially identified as a victim of Flight 801. Wendy Bunton was positively identified, but DNA samples only proved that a white male was on the plane near her. Bill and I never gave up hope um, that Sean had survived the crash. Um, even after we came home for, I would say, a year or two, every time the phone rang, every time somebody knocked on the door, um, we expected a phone message saying, hi, Dad, this is your son, Sean. Eventually, several years after the crash, Barry Small was able to give Kathy Burke and her husband some sense of finality and an enduring image of their son. When we met him and he wanted to tell us that in the 12 hour layover in Seoul, he was wandering around and finally heard two people speaking English. And he said they were so much in love that he did not want to interrupt their conversation. For Sean's father, the deep sorrow of the crash will never completely leave. For me, the grief of Sean's loss never ends. Hasn't gotten better, hasn't gotten worse. Just another day. Uh, for everybody else, it's, it's gone. You know, I expect people to move on, but I'll be the, this way till the day I'm, I'm with him again. For Barry Small, there is anger too, but also incredible gratitude for surviving. So many people have told me that I survived for a reason. I've been searching for that reason for nine years now. And I truly believe if someone would listen to my story about the oxygen and alcohol and the improvement of the seats, that I could justify in my own mind that I don't have to feel guilty about surviving.